And I guess we'll give folks another minute or two or however long it takes for our final panelists to get here. Um, so we're still waiting for, so waiting for one more person. Zach, you don't see David being stuck anywhere in the world of you. No, I don't think anybody's in the waiting room right now. Sad. Well, since I see time ticking away, let's just get started. Uh, and hopefully our final panelist will, uh, will join us at some point. Um, we'll just go with the order uh, in the program. So Pinar, do you wanna just uh, kick us off? I'll keep the time. Um, I'll, I'll start waving at 20 minutes. Um, and uh, I think I have the power to mute, but please don't make me do that. <laughs> All right, take it away. I promise I won't. Thank you so much. Um, today, hello everyone. Um, it's, it's so great to be here. Well, we would prefer um, meeting in person, but still it's great um, to be with you in this session. Tonight, today for you, tonight for us, since we're in Turkey right now, uh, it's, it's nighttime. Uh, due to the limited time, I would like to start with my presentation. I will talk about the legal nature of crypto assets today, and I will try to focus on the points coming from civil law and common law. Um, briefly, what I will be talking about is first, I would like to set the terminology straight. So what should we understand from crypto assets, since there are lots of different terminology used for this concept. Then I will talk about what pro um, why are we talking about property, property rights, or the applicability of property law rules to uh, crypto assets. Then I will give a very brief information about what's going on in the legal framework in civil law countries. Then I will turn to common law countries, and I will uh, briefly give my future projections on the issue. 
So to set the terminology straight, um, today I will be talking about the legal nature of crypto assets and specifically the legal nature of crypto assets in property law. Uh, but when we say crypto assets, there are actually lots of terms that are kind of confused with the term crypto assets. So we hear like tokens, we hear coins, we hear crypto tokens or cryptocurrencies. Um, tokens and coins actually existed before the, the uh, blockchain technology evolution. If, uh, so they, they actually existed before. Uh, and they're not always cryptographically signed and they don't have to exist on the blockchain. But when we talk about crypto tokens or cryptocurrencies, they are the introduction of the blockchain technology after 2009. Um, cryptocurrencies are what we know as like Ether or Bitcoin, which is the most famous one, but actually crypto assets are a bigger category than the cryptocurrencies. So when, when I'm talking about crypto assets, I'm referring to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ether, but also some other crypto tokens, like for example, non-fungible tokens, like the asset-based uh, backed tokens, like security tokens and utility tokens, payments tokens, et cetera. So I'm talking about a broader category here. And the main point uh, when we talk about crypto assets is that they actually affect lots of areas of law, but I will be focusing on private law aspects of crypto assets. So we know for a fact that crypto assets, like cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, as well as other crypto assets are today used to make business transactions and international business transactions. Uh, but the question is, how should we place them in the framework of rights. Are they absolute rights? Can we establish ownership on them? Can we establish other property rights on them? Can they be asserted against everyone? Or are they contractual claims that can be only asserted between the parties? And the next question is, can we conceptualize crypto assets as property? Can they be objects of property? Um, the main problem here is the fact that crypto assets that exist on blockchain, which represent values or rights, are not corporeal. So this is a problem about tangibility. Most of the countries that I'm going to deal with today uh, refer to the concept of corporeality as a condition of property. So when we talk about property, we want to see a tangible asset. So if we don't have them like we do on a distributed ledger technology on the blockchain, can we still talk about property? And this brings me to my next question. Um, why do we need to know which rules are we are going to apply to crypto assets? So why do we discuss the application of property rules? This is um, rather simple because since the emergence of the blockchain technology, there has been really good uses of it but there has also been some really harmful fraudulent acts with, which led to uh, huge amounts of losses. So in this case, when we try to establish, when we try to cancel a transaction or when we go, when, want to go back to the initial situation, how are we going to do this? Which rules are we going to apply? So can we apply, for example, the rules that we have uh, on the property law? Um, as I told you in the beginning, the main problem is we cannot directly apply most of the time the property law rules to crypto assets because we do not regard them as the assets that the traditional assets that we know because they are intangible. So the question is, can we regard the purely intangible crypto assets like NFT, like cryptocurrency, like other asset backed tokens or security tokens, et cetera, can we regard them as an object of rights? So I, you can see the general framework in the chosen three countries. I chose these three countries for a reason. These are the countries that have the narrowest approach to property. So they are really strict about how we understand property and they only define corporeal objects as uh, property. So when we look at Germany, it's clearly stated that only corporeal things can be defined as property. When we go to Switzerland, we do not actually come across with a definition of property, but the general idea uh, in the court cases and in the legal doctrine is that in order for something to be classified, defined as property, 
they have to be physical, they need to be separated from other things, so they should have a separate distinct existence, and they need to be physically and legally controlled. So the, the crypto assets which are recorded on the blockchain as ledger entries do not clearly fulfill these uh, conditions. When we go to Turkey, uh, which adopts Swiss law, Swiss civil law, we see the same idea. Uh, we see that some, um, some objects are actually equated with the concept of property, for example, energy uh, or natural forces. They are not actually tangible, but in the civil code, it's explicitly mentioned that they can also be regarded as immovable property. So the question in Swiss law and Turkish law is that, do we need to adopt a narrower uh, understanding of property or can we evaluate, interpret these norms in a more uh, general way and include crypto assets here as well? So, the, the, so there are some ideas in the doctrine and court cases that, but very minor ones, that the concept of property should be understood in a functional way, not in a traditional way. So one can also include crypto assets in these categories as well. But when we look at these countries, as well as some other countries uh, of the European Union, we can say that the, the, there's an expectation from the legislative authorities to clarify these issues. Otherwise, the, the, the property nature of crypto assets is going to be problematic. When we go to the common law, we see some developments in the last two years. And I think the United Kingdom should be mentioned here in the first uh, place. So in the United Kingdom, they always go to this leading case, National Provincial Bank versus Ainsworth, which regards the definitions of property. And the case states that in order for something to be regarded as property, it has to be definable, it has to be identifiable by third parties, it has to be capable in, in its nature of assumption by third parties, and it has to have some degree of permanence of stability. So as you can see, there is a, again, a strict definition of property. However, we're going to see how the UK courts and the UK understanding has circumvented uh, this definition and realized that crypto assets could actually be regarded as property. So in November 2019, the United Kingdom um, Jurisdiction Task Force prepared a legal statement on crypto assets and smart contracts. And they stated that crypto assets actually have all the indicia of property and that there are also some other uh, important findings, but I will not go through them due to the lack of time. Uh, but it it's basically states that just because a crypto asset does not have corporeality, it doesn't mean that they cannot be regarded as property. Uh, and although um, it might be problematic as to the distinction of um, things in action and things in possession, they do not fit in the two of the categories, but the um, UKJT just states that they can be regarded as a third category. So we don't need to stick with the strict two categories, but we can classify it as a third category. And um, this idea that was stated in the legal statement was endorsed in a court decision in 2019 in AAV Persons Unknown. Um, cr the cryptocurrency Bitcoin was regarded as property and uh, not just Bitcoins, but also crypto assets such as Bitcoin. So crypto assets were regarded as property in this case uh, in the United Kingdom. When we go to the United States, uh, we see that there is a really um, different, difficult uh, ecosystem that exists with regard to crypto assets. There are lots of regulatory uh, authorities that try to regulate the issue. Some of them regard uh, crypto assets as commodities. Some of them regard them as property, but there is no uniform understanding of what crypto assets are, how we should place them. There are some states that have regulated digital assets that uh, crypto assets are generally uh, put in a broader category in the United States as digital assets. Um, Wyoming has enacted a law and this enables intangible assets to be realized as property. Then we have Idaho, which passed the Digital Assets Act. Again, this is a broader understanding of property. When we look at the UCC Article 2, um, it might be problematic. This is the main reason why in the United States uh, it's refrained 
um, the, the digital assets are refrained from being placed as um, property due to the Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, let's look at other countries uh, in the belonging to the common law system. We have New Zealand, uh, which again had to deal with a case in 2020. And in this case, Rusco versus Crypto, uh, Cryptopia LTD. Um, again, the discussion was that was that if crypto assets could be regarded as property. And the court affirmed that digital assets uh, should be distinguished from pure information. There is this general understanding that pure information cannot be an object of property, but the court stated that digital assets should be separated from them and that cryptocurrencies specifically should not be regarded as pure information, but digital assets. So this case has been interpreted as opening a door to understanding uh, digital assets, crypto assets as property in New Zealand as well. Then we go to Singapore. Uh, in, again, 2020, uh, the Singapore High Court had to deal with a case regarding cryptocurrencies, and the court had to decide if cryptocurrencies carried the characteristics of property. And as you can see from the quote here, um, crypt, there, there, there are some difficult questions as to how to match these new, this new understanding with the existing traditional understanding of property. However, they should be capable of assimilation into the general concepts of property. So this is, uh, and again, I need to reiterate that the case that I mentioned in New Zealand, as well as in the case in Singapore, they both cite the UK Jurisdiction Tax Task Force report. So this report was significant and it changed the understanding of the common law countries and how they ruled about the legal nature of crypto assets. So to talk a little bit about what's going to happen in the future. So the, um, whenever there is a new technology, there is some time to adjust and to see what's going to happen in the future and what something is going to happen. I think we're at that stage now because there are lots of fraud with regard to cryptocurrency exchanges and some other um, third parties that are, that are included in the system. So I think the time has come to, to decide about the application of property rules uh, to crypto assets. But does this mean that we have to accept a new understanding of property? Do we have to uh, reinterpret what we understand from property or can we um, just have a broader in interpretation of property and use the existing rules or do the lawmakers need to make new legal rules with regard to crypto assets? And the third question is, can we actually establish globally uniform rules? That, that which means that because the blockchain has an idea of interna internationality just beneath it, does it mean that can we establish globally uniform rules in order to ensure that every country has a similar understanding and they know for sure what's going to happen if something goes wrong. So right now, it seems that the common law systems have had, um, have had a more flexible approach and they dealt with the problems that occurred uh, with regard to crypto assets in a more flexible way. And they did not need to make drastic changes. But when we look at some civil law countries, especially the countries following the Germanic tradition, it seems that um, they need to find a way, maybe by new legal rules, maybe by uh, establishing a new understanding of property, they need uh, to find a way to determine what's going to happen with crypto assets transactions. So I hope I did not uh, exceed my time. Uh, thank you so much. If you have any questions, I would be really happy to discuss them with you. Thank you for your patience. That was Excellent, thank you so much. Yeah, you landed exactly at 15 minutes, so I could not have timed it uh, any any better. Um, yeah, that was great. Um, uh, I said that we would do Q&A at the end if everybody's okay with that. If anybody has any burning questions right now, we're still missing our final panelists, so I think we have plenty of time. Um, if you wanna jump in and ask anything right now, um, we can do that, otherwise um, we can wait until later. Don't see anybody jumping out of their screen. So let's move on to uh, to Hussein then. Um, you have 15 or 20 minutes, uh, take your time. Uh, and um, 
And the floor is yours. Oh, great. And you have uh, slides. Perfect. Yes, thank you very much. Um, let me make it full screen. All right. Uh, thank you very much once again, and good morning, everybody. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, testamentary law, and actually um, I'll talk about the formalities in testamentary law and uh, their, their status and their future with regards to technological advancements, uh, especially audiovisual bills. So let me first about talk about the freedom of form very briefly, and then uh, the testamentary formalities. As we all know, freedom of form states that you may make um, a declaration of intent in any form that can be written, that can be oral, but there are some exceptional cases and um, testamentary law and testamentary formalities, they, they are one of such exception where uh, many legal systems require, for instance, testaments to be handwritten or they need to be notarized. Some legal systems require testaments to be, uh, to be conducted before witnesses. Otherwise, the testament would be invalid. So, so we have seen that there is an exception to the freedom of formality, uh, for, for freedom of contract, when we talk about testamentary law, but uh, only in some very exceptional cases, a testament might be non cooperative in other words, oral. So uh, only in some case of emergency, uh, legal systems allow the testators to execute a will in oral form. And uh, such testaments would be automatically terminated if the uh, testator is still alive after a specific time period uh, following the conclusion of the oral will. So uh, testamentary, there are strict testamentary formalities in legal systems, but uh, oral form uh, is highly unexceptional. So when we trace uh, when we trace the wills, uh, early traces can be found in earlier civilizations, but scholars accept that will is a Roman institution and the true power of testation was first known to the Romans. So in Roman law, uh, there were three different main types of wills and the most widespread one required some very strict formalities like uh, the the presence of a trustee and the presence of witnesses were required. And there was a uh, mind patio ritual, which was, which, which, was uh, which had to be strictly followed. Otherwise, testaments would be invalid. Within time, when we move to early modern Europe, we, we see that the canon law was designed to provide ease of making wills, unlike drama law. So here, the role of witnesses uh, were less important. And uh, there was the aim of making sure that the sinner can make a will even in his or her last minutes. Therefore, will making must be easy. With it, now, in contemporary law, we see four different types of wills. Holograph will, the written one, and witnessed will, public will, or it's also named as the notarial will. And there are also some special exceptional wills. But even today, many countries are reluctant to grant validity to oral wills. So uh, let's see some examples because um, starting from the Roman law and then uh, even today, we see that form superiority over substance is diminishing and that's something good. Testamentary formalities are being mellowed. So uh, substance is more important. So let's see some examples, for instance, in the United States, courts, courts have developed the doctrine of substantial compliance, and in some uh, continental European countries, uh, non-compliance with form results in voidability rather than voidness. And uh, in some other legal systems, you can convert an invalid will into another type of will that would be valid. So these show that um, the, the substance is gaining superiority over the form, and that's also something good. And now coming to the te technological advances, we might say that there were some attempts to modernize succession law and keep up with techno technological advances, but such attempts have not been very successful. For instance, there is a 1935 dated, uh, dated Scottish court case where the court said that typewritten documents are also holograph bills, but no other jurisdiction followed the lead. And there are some states 
in the United States, which exceptionally allow wills to be signed by elect electoral signatures, but uh, many other legal systems are uh, still behaving quite conservative in this regard. So the result, legal systems take to testamentary formalities despite some attempts. But why? What are the functions of formalities? So when we talk about the functions of formalities, one should make reference to Fuller's well-known distinction about the functions of formalities. And according to the author, there are three main functions. One, evidentiary function. Form requirements provides legal clarity and certainty. When you follow the form, it can be easy to prove the transaction. Second one, cautionary function. When you have to follow a specific form requirement, you, 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 you should be cautious. That will alert you and you will be more careful. And then channeling function. Uh, form requirements mark and signalize to the courts that the parties regard their promise as enforceable. So these are the three main functions. Now let's see uh, whether the contemporary types of wills, namely the public will, holograph will, and witness will, whether these wills bestow the functions of testamentary formalities. So when you start with the public wills, for instance, notarial will, it would have it would best of the cautionary, evidentiary, and channeling functions. In holograph bills, uh, evidentiary and channeling functions would be present, uh, but they would fall behind notarial bills with regards to the cautionary functions because it's always easier to get some piece of pen and paper and make your will rather than going to the notary and providing him or her with your ID and signing documents and so on. When we come to the witness will, it stands in between holograph will and the notarial will. Um, it's, 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 if it's prepared a, by a lawyer, it displays cautionary function. And uh, in such cases, it can easily be discovered. But there is a problem, a major problem with witness wills because it fails uh, in terms of its evidentiary function because witnesses can lie. They may forget, they may make mistakes and you, reliability of witnesses can always be questioned. So coming to the audiovisual wills, um, there was a, a reform project in Switzerland dated 19, uh, 2016. And actually that project was what inspired me to make this research and write this paper. Even if the provisions concerning the audiovisual wills, the provisions that I'll explain in a minute, did not find its way to the first official statement. Um, th this was a very important and uh, interesting step in Swiss law because uh, the reform project stated that the testators could make audiovisual wills in case of emergency. That was restricted to the case of emergency. And um, the testator had to be had to appear on the recording, state his or her name, and explain the extraordinary circumstances. And if possible, state the date and also his last wishes. According to the provision, Two witnesses would not be necessary because uh, we have the audiovisual will, the testator is speaking there, so we don't need the witnesses, but the will would lose its validity 14 days after the raise of an opportunity to make a will in another form. In other words, if the testator does not die, the, lose, the, the will will be terminated automatically. So th that made me think, could audiovisual wills bestow the functions of testamentary formality? because nowadays everyone, almost everyone, let me say, carries a cell phone. And uh, if you ask someone to provide you with a pen and paper or witnesses, that would be more difficult than just taking your cell phone out and making a recording. So if so, it, it's quite easy to make an audiovisual in, uh, in that way. So uh, we must discuss whether audiovisual wills best of the functions of testamentary formalities, because will making must be as easy as possible so that everyone can decide on the future of his or her estate. But there are some valid concerns about the risk of an audiovisual will. First of all, there is the risk of coercion and abuse due to the lack of witnesses. So you can never know if someone points a gun uh, when you are making the uh, video. And there is the authenticity risk of the audiovisual will. The recording can be tempered. Uh, there might be some technical problem. It can be unauthentic and so on. And it's argued that when this would increase the number of uh, court cases due to, the, uh, due to the reason that those audiovisuals should be registered and deposited. And finally, there is a problem about the 
challenging function because it might be difficult for a court to decide whether a recording really reflects the intentions of the testator as a will, or it can be something like a joke or some uh, uncontemplated thoughts and so on. And this is an important problem, especially when the audiovisual wills are not registered or deposited. So here comes my proposal. I propose to establish an electronic gateway registry system. Today, many countries have their password protected gateways where they want public services. And with their personal passwords, citizens can uh, enter into these gateways. So why don't we create a digital registry and integrate a module into these gateways where the citizens could upload their audiovisual wheels? That could be an uh, audio or visual recording. So this, these could be simply transferred, directly transferred to the public authorities who, who could process them after the data of the testator. And if the testator changes his or her mind, he could simply just erase these recordings or he or she could upload more than one wheels. And in such cases, uh, since the dates, upload dates are uh, there within the, within the recording, the, most probably the latest one would uh, be the valid one. So otherwise the wheels could supplement each other. And that's what happens in many legal systems. For instance, if you have two uh, holograph wheels with, and uh, if there is no contradiction between them, one could argue that they supplement each other. Now, uh, when we see that audiovisual wheels are possible, then we should discuss whether uh, they should be restricted to the case of emergency and whether they should be terminated automatically uh, when uh, the, the emergency uh, disappears. In my opinion, the answer is no, because many people refrain from making their will until the very last moment, and audiovisual wills would enable such people to declare their last wishes. So there is no use in preventing these people from making their wills. So let's make a risk assessment of my proposal. So first of all, there is no need for witnesses. This is something good because when you make an audiovisual will, uh, you are there. So we don't need a witness to state that you were there because we can see that you were there, you were speaking uh, in the video. And uh, in such cases, there is no higher risk regarding coercion or authenticity because uh, I think your video is more reliable than a witness who could lie. And even public officials may conduct uh, fraudulent behavior, we know that. And um, with regards to the authenticity, since um, you, up, you are in the recording and you, your uh, personal password to upload the document, and this password is at your own disposal. Therefore, in my opinion, audiovisual wills do not, uh, have higher risk than any other type of bill. So what about the channeling function? You use your password and you upload the video to the platform. This should reflect your intention. And cautionary function, still there is a formality you need to follow. Therefore, there, this, this bestows the cautionary function as well. And there is no discoverability risk of audiovisual wills. When you upload them to the registry, they are directly sent to the uh, relevant authorities. Or you could even just enable the testator to send such wills by email or other means to their friends or other people, beneficiaries. So is registration really necessary? Because I might seem like contradicting by myself because I argued that we should make will making as easy as possible. And then I say, uh, if registration is necessary. In my opinion, yes, it is necessary because uh, yes, we should make real making easy and affordable, but we cannot sacrifice the functions of testamentary formalities. We must make sure that a video found on your phone or co your computer uh, is different than, uh, it, it might not reflect your intention to be bound. You might not be serious. So when you upload it to the registry, to this gateway, it will reflect your serious intention that you regard this as a testament. And if, for instance, uh, the, the, the videos are recorded on later dates, but, the, uh, but you send them by email and the, the date of the uh, recording, uh, the, the date of the recording is 
before the date you send it. And so, so th th there might be co confusing cases to decide which audio recording or, or, or visual recording on your cell phone reflects your true intention. But when you use the registration system, we have no such problems. So coming to the end, I have two final slides. Uh, I discuss why people die in test states and what can audiovisual will offer in this regard. Will can offer in this regard. Well, uh, we cannot find the exact numbers, but but in civil law countries, test to see rights are about thirty percent. That's quite low, and the reason is, according to the literature, first of all, fear of mortality. People don't want to die. And, or perhaps they are satisfied with the defaulters because we, when you don't have a testament, when you don't have a valid bill, um, the default rules will apply. And finally, it might be because people have very tiny uh, estates and they do not just uh, th th don't care about making a testament because uh, their estate is uh, very small. And what else could it be? In my opinion, one of the reasons could be bounded rationality. What is that? Uh, according to law and economics literature, people have very uh, infinite, they find it cognitive, cognitive abilities. So when you make a judgment, you very often resort to some mental shortcuts. And some of these mental shortcuts might uh, prevent testators from making wills. And therefore, I argue that making a will must be as easy as possible and we should allow people to make their wills even in their latest minutes. What are these biases? First one, egocentric bias. People are very op op uh, optimistic and they underestimate the risks of the uh, occurrence of negative events. So they do not expect to die anytime soon. So why should they make a will? Then the statistical bias. Well, uh, people like the statistical. Therefore, they may stick with, stick with the default rules of succession law, even if they do not have an accurate knowledge of the default rules of the law. So that might be one of the reasons why people do not just make wills. Third one, procrastination. People may voluntarily delay will making. And finally, myopia. People tend to discount future costs and benefits in comparison to immediate ones. How is that related? People might be refraining from making the expenses to consult a lawyer or applying to the notary for making their wills. When we consider all these facts, all these factors, I argue that audiovisual wills, which bestow the functions of formalities, could be the answer, which would increase the testacy rates and allow people to make their wills in their last minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hussein. That was great. Um, uh, before we move on, I have two very quick points. Those are not like discussion questions or just sort of like they occurred to me. So if you don't want to respond, that's totally fine. Two things that occurred to me in your risk assessment um, that I'm super curious um, if you have um, thought about those. So what do you do with deep fakes is one. That seems mm -hmm. problematic, right? Um, and then just potential cybersecurity risks. And of course you can say, well, whatever, wherever you store the handwritten will, right? If you give it to like the court or whatever, if that burns down, right? That's mm -hmm. that's equally uh, a, a risk. And so, what, you know, why would Claudia be worried about cybersecurity when there's just like real world actual security? Um, but um, but those were just two things that, that I was curious about. Um, so if you want to respond, that's totally fine. If you want to push it to the Q and A, that's also fine. Yeah, I could respond now. I could respond now. Thank you, first of all. I know that audiovisual wills would not be perfect. But what I argue is that any type of will, I have shown some uh, problems with all types of wills and they're all problematic. So, but we don't just say uh, like, I don't know, witness wills should be forbidden or like, uh, test, like handwritten wills should be invalid. We don't say that, we accept them despite the risks. So yes, deep fakes the problem, but, uh, you upload the video by using your own personal password. So that functions as a second level of protection. So even if the video is fake, the, the, the faker should have your uh, password to upload it. Once again, this wouldn't be perfect, but none of the wheels, none of the types of, no type of wheel is perfect. Yeah, and I'm I'm super sympathetic to your to your larger point, which is this should be as easy as possible. 
Um, so I, you you totally convinced me on that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Luigi and Isabella, do you have a um, do you have an order that you're going in? Yeah, uh, I'll start. Yeah. I was I was going to say you have to fight that out amongst yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All I right. would lose. Or is yours. <laughs> Can you see the can you see the screen? Super. Yep. So thank you very much uh, first of all for having us here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Unfortunately, we cannot do this in person. It would have been uh, much uh, much better. So um, our research it's titled "Post Quantum Encryption and Privacy Regulation: Can the Law Keep Pace with Technology?" Um, what we try to do is using an interdisciplinary law and computer science approach. Um, we argued that quantum computing, it's a, a very good reason to push lawmakers to implement more dynamic privacy regulation uh, with the goal to, can, to cushion quantum computing's impact on data protection and privacy, but also to look beyond quantum computing and implement dynamic privacy and data protection law that can cushion the really fast um, and dynamic development of technology. So our article highlights the GDPR position as the global standard for data protection and privacy regulation. Um, as we all know, the GDPR has ignited the legal standardization phenomenon, whereby several jurisdictions worldwide are shaping their privacy regulation based on it. Um, and so what we say is that a move by lawmakers in Brussels to amend the GDPR in, uh, in, in light of post-quantum encryption um, would ignite a global paradigm shit, shift. Um, this would entail significant uh, uh, improvement in protection of data subjects um, and, and so forth. But let's start with explaining why we started looking at this, why we embarked into this, um, this research. Um, okay, so... Um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with quantum computing, but quantum computing is still very far from mainstream adoption. And as you can see from this picture, uh, it's still mostly confined to um, academia, to mostly to research in physics and to the tech giants that are really trying to be the number one, be achieve the so-called um, quantum supremacy. And the reason why we started looking at um, quantum computing and in particular at the impact that quantum computing can have on current encryption practices, it's because quantum computing, it's been proven that can not only threaten, but actually completely destroy uh, existing data protection and privacy practices. And regulation and laws worldwide today strongly rely on encryption as a tool to protect personal information. Right, if you look at the GDPR, for example, where it tells you that you need to implement uh, technical and organizational measures such as encryption, uh, that's a clear example of this. Um, the pace of development in quantum computing, as I said before, really should inspire not only legislation, but also supervisory authorities to reconsider uh, how laws and regulation ca can soften the blow that quantum uh, quantum computing can have on data protection. Um, so, um, in 2019, quantum computing sort of surfaced, became a bit more, uh, um, not only a buzzword, but also started like tickling the research appetite across different fields. And that's because uh, Google announced that it had achieved quantum supremacy. This is a bit um, over the top as a claim because actually it only achieved quantum supremacy for one particular task that they tested. They didn't achieve it globally. Um, what that means is that it took Google's quantum computer 200 seconds to complete a task that would have required a normal computer 10,000 years to complete. Um, China really didn't wait in line. And in 2020, um, Chinese scientists also announced um, that they achieved quantum supremacy, albeit using a different technology. The Chinese quantum computer is based on, on photons, so it's, it's significantly different. Uh, what this means is that there's a global race to quantum supremacy. Uh, other companies like IBM and uh, Facebook also are in the race and are really trying to, uh, to achieve quantum supremacy. So um, there's a ton of research out there 
ranging from computer science to computer engineering to uh, cybersecurity to physics that has shown that quantum computing can in fact break modern symmetric uh, and asymmetric cryptography. For those of you that are not familiar with this term, symmetric cryptography is the type of cryptography that requires a public key and a private key, whereas asymmetric cryptography just requires one public key. Um, so what this means is that this research has def definitely said, you know what, this quantum computing problem is a severe problem because our entire internet infrastructure relies on encryption for our data to transit privately and securely across hosts. So what can we do about this? And obviously we as legal scholars need to ask ourselves the questions, how can laws and regulation keep up with technological development and also keep up you know, with quantum computing? Um, but what's quantum computing? Before we move forward, quantum computers leverage quantum mechanics to perform computation. Um, if after this presentation, you're still very confused about it, it's absolutely normal. I spent like two years trying to figure this out and I'm really very confused about it every time I read a new book. Um, so essentially, Quantum mechanics refers to the way that our reality behaves at the micro level. And it's really opposed to the way our reality behaves at the macro level. So if you look at the, um, the theory of relativity that was brought forward by Einstein and you compare it to quantum mechanics, the two things really don't match. And that's, that's a problem that physicists have. Um, and um, so computer scientists actually understood that uh, they could sort of play with quantum mechanics and speed up computation significantly. Um, and to do this, what they've done, they've taken advantage of uh, two phenomena called uh, uh, entanglement and superposition. Um, in a normal computer, when you look at the CPU, there's a bunch of transistors, which basically work as doors, deciding when power needs to go through. And each time the power goes through, either at zero, it is, either we give, them a, we give the CPU a signal as at zero, which means that there's no power going through and therefore no calculation is performed, or we give it the power one and the calculation is performed. Um, with quantum computing, um, it's zero and one simultaneously, but also, which means that the calculation is always performed and uh, the probability of achieving the right result is maximized. Um, I put below a, a quote by a famous physicist, if you're not completely confused by quantum mechanics, you do not understand it. Um, and we're all extremely confused about it. Um, and then, We've seen what's quantum computing. We've looked at the problem statement. Let's look at the encryption. What, what is it and why is it threatened? So encryption is the process of mathematically encoding a message so that its meaning is not obvious. We've been doing, as you might have been doing encryption for years, like probably centuries. And you know, it's very famous how we were coding messages during Second World War. And then the field really significantly exploded during the Cold War um, with um, these widely known encryption algorithms such as DES, AES, and RSA, which have been actually built, some of them, by uh, scientists that were engaged by the government during the Cold War. Um, and as I said before, 80% of our line communication are secured with encryption. If you look at this conversation that we're having now, right, and you can actually see that Zoom tells us that it's encrypted and went. Um, and privacy laws and regulation require organization to use encryption to protect our personal data. In Europe, now in the US, in many states, in China especially now, there's been a very strong push for this. Um, and so quantum computing's power could significantly solve um, the mathematical process behind encryption and completely decrypt our personal data and endanger our ecosystem. Um, the term post-quantum encryption was coined by mathematicians. Um, they were the first to be aware of the perils brought by quantum computing vis-a-vis -vis encryption. And so they started launching private initiatives that were aimed at creating post-quantum encryption algorithms. Um, and their role, their goal is actually to keep our personal data secured in a post-quantum world. Uh, the US Institute for Standardization has acknowledged this and has launched the post-quantum encryption standardization project. Um, and 
what this project entails is that it has asked mathematicians to submit proposals for quantum secure encryption algorithms. Um, in the EU, ENISA, the European Cybersecurity Agency, also has written a white paper recently um, guiding companies on how to implement already now quantum safe encryption. But as we all know, standardization doesn't equal regulation, and more is needed. And I'll leave the floor to my colleague, Isabella. Thank you so much. So I'm going to focus more on the regulatory aspects of uh, our proposal. Uh, so what we were looking into, um, into GDPR, different uh, regulation regarding uh, privacy, data protection, and so on. Uh, as Luigi mentioned, he, uh, um, we realized that evidently the GDPR as a tool to implement regulation worldwide and to inspire regulation worldwide could be used even for uh, consideration for or on puts quantum encryption. Uh, so uh, the issue that we found um, to begin with was the fact that uh, legislations require time. First of all, legislators themselves are individuals, they're human beings, so they're subjected to timeframes that are not perfect. And not only, um, as Luigi mentioned, um, questions of time regarding certain technologies um, make so that there may be uh, an inertia because the, uh, the expectation for the production of certain technologies is that it will take 15, 20, 30 years, we don't know yet. So the idea is that, well, we can wait, but can we wait? So uh, what we put in the slide, for example, is a timeline of how long it took for the GDPR uh, from its uh, inception to its actual applica application. Um, so uh, we have uh, the beginning in 2012 uh, with the proposal of a reform of the pre-existing uh, framework regarding data protection. And then at the very end in 2018, when the GDPR was actually applicable. So what is the main concern is time of the legislator versus the time it takes technology to actually be implemented and to start being an actual issue. So what we wanted to focus was a proactive approach to uh, regulation rather than uh, an inertia that has been seen, unfortunately, oftentimes by legislators worldwide uh, so what we were looking into was this concept of privacy by design, uh, which was um, initially theorized by privacy scholar Anke Vukian. Um, and uh, this concept itself has been um, partially, let's say, implemented within the GDPR at Article uh, 25, which focuses on uh, data protection by design. Uh, this is an approach which is rather dynamic, uh, which is why we were especially interested in this principle of private, privacy by design, and it will promote um, uh, a dynamic approach to legislation uh, facing new and upcoming or even farther in the future issues. For example, as uh, um, the previous, just making an example, the previous uh, presentation was about testaments and wills, uh, audiovisual consideration. And what uh, Claudia was bringing up, for example, is our deep fakes. These are considerations that need constant uh, thought by legislators, by scholars, etc. Because obviously the implementation of new technology will make existing systems not only imperfect but unsafe. Uh, so uh, there are seven foundational principles of privacy by design um, uh, which uh, categorize this uh, model as First of all, proactive. So the idea is that proactivity versus reactivity is fundamental. Uh, this is both uh, valid for uh, businesses, but also for legislators, because unfortunately, legislators are rather reactive. There is an issue. The issue uh, evolves. It comes to the attention of the public, of the legislators, of experts, and then gets 
with time uh, put into legislation and into different regulatory frameworks. However, this is not acceptable because of the great threats that this can mean for privacy, but also for other fundamental rights uh, of the of um, civilians. So. Another point that is made uh, within the principles is privacy by default. So the idea is that the entire system of business requires the thought of privacy concerns to be constantly implemented and pushed forward in the creation of the business, which then looks into the idea of uh, privacy being embedded into the design. And this is where uh, we found that the GDPR mostly lost the original idea of the privacy by design as it was uh, created by Kavukian, because the idea of embedding privacy within design is exactly the fact that in every process, in every aspect, privacy is a consideration and not only in data processing operation. As you can see, Article 25 really focuses at its core on what are data processing operations, which means that all the other parts of the business may actually not have in mind privacy. This is not a requirement by law. Um, so when we talk about privacy by design as implemented within the law, we also need this idea of in being embedded and it being by default within the system. And this is a gap that can result in unsatisfactory and counterproductive approach to protection of data and to privacy. Uh, so. Uh, we wanted to compare this approach of the GDPR, which is um, it, it is definitely a milestone in data protection and privacy, and which is why we were focusing on it, because there is a lot that is a promise to the future and that can be reformed. Uh, and we looked into, as Luigi mentioned, the uh, NIST standardization. So uh, this is a standardization that has been proposed uh, by um, the NIST, which is within the US Department of Commerce. And well, the idea, like, the aim of the project is to create and standardize uh, a set of um, quantum resistant cryptographic algorithms. Uh, the idea is extremely forward thinking and constantly dynamic because even though the idea is to standardize two or three uh, algorithms by, I believe, uh, 2022, I may be wrong. Um, the idea is that even though the standardization for now is limited to two or three or even just one because it's extremely difficult, this process, it is to continuously look into this issue, continuously try to produce novel algorithms, novel considerations about the issue. So what we want, uh, what we wanted to um, advance is the proposal for lawmakers worldwide, especially in the, at the UL level. And um, we had already written uh, this article and we were very happy and satisfied to see that um, uh, already European um, authorities had been looking into, obviously, um, quantum encryption and quantum cryptography, um, because uh, the idea of this um, common market is extremely interesting uh, for uh, businesses, for investors, but also it's extremely useful for uh, every citizen. Uh, because, for example, the GDPR has inspired legislation uh, um, in Quebec, uh, where where I am uh, currently, it has inspired uh, legislation in, in California, but also in other in other different um, uh, jurisdictions. And this embedding of potential uh, standardization and standardized algorithms to protect data and privacy from for the uh, future threat could be very promising in our opinion. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much, and uh, it was a pleasure. That was excellent. Thank you. And also, great job coming in at 18 minutes, so I did not have to cut anybody off. <laughs> um, sadly, we're still missing uh, David, and so that gives us plenty of time to discuss, um, uh, because we have technically until um, until 1.45. So, um, Anybody want to react to anybody else's paper on the panel? Um, 
I have a few thoughts, but I would much rather have you all discuss. Uh, Isabella, yeah. So uh, I really like both presentations. I, 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 I also thought about deep fake. So I was like, okay, so it's like an interesting thought. It's it's going in the minds of people. Uh, and I also was interested about Pinar. Uh, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly. Uh, <laughs> good. Uh, but your presentation. So we were talking about incorporeal um, property. And I was thinking about, um, for example, the idea of immaterial goods uh, that is present, I guess, in many legislations, like mostly considering, I would say, copyright, uh, intellectual property, and so on. And I was looking into, for example, I'm, I'm from Italy, and I was looking into the Italian regime, and there was, in fact, an issue even there, like they had to ask for opinions about this of, of experts, because it was not clear. So would a consideration on, let's say, copyright or private, um, sorry, uh, intellectual property be uh, included in a potential framework? Thank you very much uh, for the question. So the, the IP rights are also um, important in this area. So I think one of their intersection is that um, when we try to position crypto assets in the bundle of rights, you know, in order to establish um, rights on them, like either absolute rights or relative rights on them, we also try to establish, um, can we regard them as IP, for example, but, but this is, I mean, ruled out. Uh, but another, like, I understand that you're talking about the idea between them. So we have absolute rights on IP rights. When we talk about IP rights, they are also immaterial, but there were rights established on them. So um, can we use the same idea to grant um, property, uh, to, to grant the uh, crypto assets uh, a right to property on the, with the same essence? I think this could also be discussed. So I have also uh, come across with some authors who would agree with you uh, that this idea could also uh, be used for the, the idea of material goods could also be used for um, crypto uh, crypto assets as well. But they are somehow also um, different because they only they only exist on the distributed ledger and they don't have any. So they have some. Uh, other unique problems that are specific to the distributed ledger technology. So just like you mentioned, the the, the cryptography problem and um, how do we the, the fraud problem, etc. So they are kind of I think they have some some of their differences as well. But I think the fact that we can um, establish rights on thoughts or or um, the the findings that we have, um, I think the same way we can also establish. Uh, rights on on the block on the the token or the crypto assets as well. If that that might answer your question. So yeah, this is something I have come across with. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, Hussein, I see your your hand. Yeah, th thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks for the presentations, Kunar, Isabella, and Luigi, and I, I really enjoyed all of them and. Um, I should also especially thank Isabella and Luigi because uh, I teach data protection and um, I have no idea about uh, quantum technology. And when I heard that, if you are not completely confused by the mechanics, you do not understand, this, uh, that, that, I'm not the problem, that's not me. <laughs> okay, that makes me happy. But um, it was not directly related with your um, uh, presentation, but, uh, when, when I teach the issue, I say when I teach about uh, GDPR and anonymized data, uh, I quote other scholars, and that's the reason why, because I do not have the technical knowledge about the issue. I say, uh, according to the scholars, uh, in the near future, there will be no anonymized data because the quantum computers and quantum mechanics will make it impossible to anonymize data. So uh, I know that's not directly related to your, with your presentation, but uh, do you have an opinion? Do you have an idea about the issue? I can go, Isabel, if you want. Um, so I think, so I think uh, 
we, first of all, I think we need to make a distinction between anonymization and encryption because encrypted data is not anonymous data. So usually encryption is used to pseudonymize data, right? Which means that with the right key or with the right technology such as quantum, you could go back. Um, I often hear like cybersecurity professionals that tell me, hey, my data is pseudonymized, so I do not fall within the scope of GDPR. And my answer is always like, if supervisory authority heard you, you'd probably be in trouble. Uh, but um, on the other hand, anonymization is based on a lot of techniques, right? And what I, I see mostly professionally is that uh, synthetic data sets are becoming more and more prevalent in the industry. So synthetic data sets are basically data sets that are built with fake, I, fake personal identifiable information, which are meant to sort of mimic when analyzed using machine learning or statistics are, pre, are supposed to sort of mimic the, um, the original data set. Uh, I think that in theory, quantum computing could potentially mine some of uh, existing uh, anonymization techniques. But I think that the problem with quantum computing is mostly that we should ask ourselves the question, which data we really need to protect now in the event that in 25 years, quantum computing are you know, available to everybody. Because if somebody steals my encrypted credit card information now, and then they decrypt them in 25 years, my credit card is gonna be expired. So whatever, right? But if somebody steals my social security number today, and then they decrypt it in 25 years when I'm about to retire, then I have a big problem. And that's why we were arguing with the fact that we really need to act now. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Thoughts on the presentations? Um, I sort of had a, a, a question that I think uh, goes both for, um, oh, wait, before I start, uh, Boris, I see there's a hand up. So why don't you go first? I, um, thank you everybody for the excellent presentations. And the question is for Pinar. Um, I, I wanted to uh, say this is an especially valuable uh, perspective looking at crypto from a, uh, from a comparative um, viewpoint, um, especially because so much of the discourse around crypto and blockchain law um, supposes that common law uh, legal forms are naturally um, uh, going to become the universal norms within the ecosystem. And your focus on uh, property law is, um, is very insightful, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the intersection of property law and contract law, and specifically the phenomenon within crypto of the contractization of property law forms. So if we're talking about intellectual property um, and consider a crypto legal form, such as an NFT, and then a further crypto legal form, such as um, a fractionalized um, token that is going to split the NFT property rights into various subunits. What we're seeing is contract law trying to um, assert, displace, constrain, and define the underlying property relations. Um, and so with projects like Materium, as an example, one of the things that they're, um, they're doing, and, and quite openly in their legal engineering is creating a legal framework for the wholesale contractization of property law. So instruments like bailments and so forth. And what inevitably um, happens is contractization along common law lines. And the result is that we have Anglo-American common law of contract becoming the dominant legal framework and usurping and potentially displacing property law, which is a lot more, um, uh, which is a lot more um, 
locally contingent. And so I'm wondering if, if, uh, if you could share your thoughts on, on that intersection between contract and sort of a cosmopolitan common law approach to contract and the more um, you know, parochial in the comparative law sense view of property law. Okay, thank you so much. This was such an excellent input. I wish I could, you know, take notes from the beginning. So I, um, you, you really elaborated on that. So good. thank you so much for the insights. Yeah. Um, so the, the main problem, I think one of the main problems of blockchain technology is that uh, we don't know um, which roles will be applicable in, in the first sense. So because we're dealing with an international um, international system and this gives rise to international problems. This also gives rise to the question of which laws will be applicable. So we are technically, just like you said, we are um, talking about the, um, like as a theory, we're talking about the application of property rules, but actually by the use of smart contracts, we're trying to do some legal engineering and uh, without even realizing just like standard contract terms, we are just giving in um, to the dominance of contract law, what's going to, um, you know, happen and, um, you know, the, the design is going to be just like you said, common law dominance. But I think what, what's going to be problematic is that when something goes wrong with that contractual relationship, and we have to dissolve that relationship, then um, in, in, at some point, uh, depending on the nature of the transaction, we might need to apply uh, property law rules as well. But then the question comes, which property law? So uh, this brings to my mind something that I read, and I think I kind of agree. Um, I don't know the, the writer, but um, he wrote that we need to, with regard to the distributed ledger technology, we need to uh, find rules, um, especially with regard to property law rules. So the applicability or the the um, how, like if, if we're going to apply property law rules and how we're going to apply property law rules. But aside from these two questions, we also need to make some uniform understanding of what's going to happen in that case. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna have to deal with lots of questions when we are dissolving a contract. Uh, we're gonna have lots of questions about which national property law will be applicable which, is, which adds a, an additional layer of problems because unlike contract law, it's not going to be as uniform. So um, I think this, this requires, um, just like you put it, I think this requires a, a uniform study maybe or a uniform projection. But honestly, I don't see how this is going to happen. Seeing that there are lots of countries, I, I meant I, like in, in the Europe, uh, in the European Union, I focused on only three countries, but I have uh, studied on more than three of them. I just didn't include them, but there are lots of uh, studies that are going on. There are lots of projects, there are some drafts, there are some projections. So I don't know how the, the countries are gonna dissolve, uh, resolve their own problems with regards to, uh, the, to the blockchain, their own perspectives, and then getting a uniform perspective and try to find some uh, general solutions. I think this is very problematic. I don't know how it's going to be dealt with. <laughs> but thank you very much. This was really, really insightful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm waiting for more hands for the queue, but while we're waiting, um, you know, I think just following up on what uh, what Boris was saying, I, you know, I think that that is also an invitation to you, I think, and, you know, either in this in this project or in, in future research um, to just go a little bit beyond sort of the descriptive part and, and try to offer more of a theory of, you know, where you think this should be going, because I think there, there are several axes that you could take. Right. So you have the common law, civil law distinction, you have the contract. Um, the contract and, and property distinction and, and the overlap. Uh, of course, those interact with common law and civil law understandings of what those categories mean. And then you also have your conflicts kind of uh, questions. And I think rather than sort of throwing everything into one bucket and saying it's complicated, um, 
this would really benefit from sort of taking a normative perspective of well, you know, if this is if this is so complicated, and what what should be our um, our solutions? Um, and I think I have kind of a similar uh, comment for for Isabella and Luigi, right? So like, take the take the normative perspective and just push it a little further and 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 go beyond sort of your um, the sort of uh, you know I think I think Luigi and his answer uh, earlier got to some of it right so we have to um, sort of triage a little bit and see what's important and what's not important but for that we need a theory of what we deem important or not right and can't it could be sort of a temporal sort of well this can harm you know be like a, a theory of harm Im, you know more imminent or less imminent sort of you know future future concerns as opposed to uh, imminent concerns um, but I'd be I'd be curious if if there's sort of a a, a normative um, kind of at, uh, angle you can you can bring to these uh, to these projects, um, so I have um, uh, I have Luigi and Pinar with hands up. So uh, uh, Luigi, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I just have a um, comment for uh, you, Shane. I I found your um, research really fascinating, and I I also think. Uh, um, like personally, there will be like two interesting um, additional angle that to build on top of that. And I think one would be to look at the security aspects of um, what, what you propose, right? And the other one would be, I, 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 have got, I got my first uh, law degree in Italy where um, notarial law is really strong because uh, notaries are massive lobby. And uh, it's one of, uh, if you look at the World Bank uh, uh, efficiency report for legal systems, um, and in particular, look at the one for Italy. One of the categories that apparently really drags down the ease of doing business in Italy is actually notaries and notarial law. And I think it would be interesting to see if there are provisions, for instance, in countries like Italy, but I also think France is very similar, which would hinder the concrete application of what you propose and what could be done to sort of like overcome these boundaries. Okay, thank you. I, I noted them. I mean, I present I, I presented this paper at another conference, and deep fakes was one of the uh, criticisms there, and that's a very solid one. And uh, the security issue was uh, also raised, and uh, I'm still trying to figure out an answer that goes beyond uh, stating that all testamentary forms have their own flaws. But I couldn't find one yet. But I'm still trying and I'll definitely check uh, Italian law and the, the, the civil law countries in general to decide whether there are, uh, to find out whether there are some laws uh, that would hinder the argument. I, I didn't think about that. Thank, thanks, that's a, a very uh, cooperative uh, comment. Thank you. Um, Pinar. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify something um, after Boris's and Claudia's point. Um, so um, I did not really focus on the part, the, the intersection uh, between the property law and contract law. Um, like I, I did slightly on the paper, but not really here um, because of the lack of time. But I will go deeper in that. But that's a good idea. But I just want to say that my initial um, starting point for this paper was that uh, we see lots of different um, like court decisions or reports or some you know um, solid understanding in the common law countries so they, they they set the example where the law becomes more flexible and easier to adapt to the technologies and to the new newly emerging technologies whereas we have the I, I said I set out the bad examples, the bad uh, meaning that they were not really um, they were not really eager to you know change their traditional understanding of property. So the initial uh, point for my presentation was to show how the the two systems are differently reacting, and I actually wanted to show how um, common law was more flexible. Therefore, there is kind of a suggestion. Uh, that's maybe I did not really explicitly state here, and it is that the, the common law um, was more adaptive to these technologies, not only because they had the you know dominance in the uh, in the crypto ecosystem or something, but because I think they had the tools and they had the the court decisions and they had 
a more flexible uh, because of the 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 understanding of common law really the history of common law uh, but the civil law countries were um I, I can see that most of them are really struggling to position them. So that was, I think, kind of my starting point. Um, so I, I just don't want to sound like, OK, this is like this and this is like that. Choose whatever the one you like. I just wanted to clarify that um, so that they did. So I could show that my initial position uh, was to show that I think uh, civil law countries uh, could really depart from the traditional understanding of property because these problems require not only a national understanding but international understanding and they require faster solutions. So um, I think that the traditional understanding would hinder that. That's why I. Yeah, that's great. So. Um... I mean, you could totally make this a story about just sort of, you know, common law, civil law distinctions, right? I mean, that's that's sort of, um, you could also make this an, another, just to add another layer of complication to an already complicated uh, uh, project. You know, you could also make this about intellectual property. You could, you could draw in some of the intellectual property um, uh, cases from civil law countries, because there's another area where, you know, technological innovation happens quickly, and and uh, and it's modeled on a on a slightly different sort of property uh, understanding of of you know of intangible um, uh, property. So there could be some more fruitful sort of engagement with that um, going forward. I think you have uh, in our discussion at least three papers in there, uh, <laughs> depending on how much time you want to spend with this. Um, other questions or comments? Yeah, Vanessa. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question or comment goes to uh, Luigi and Isabella. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to follow along all your uh, presentation because I kept going disconnected all the time. Uh, but this is a general comment. I would like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, so given that anonymization is not possible, even if the GDPR asks for it, because it conflicts with different provisions, one of them related to the right to be forgotten and also the right of data portability. Does whoever handles the data sets in whatever form, even using the most sophisticated encryption uh, techniques, the handler needs to know to whom these data are referred to. And, and so thinking about this and thinking about your proposal of privacy by design and that we have to enhance this type of um, privacy protections that are embedded or built in uh, the technology. Uh, I think that the most significant contribution is, of course, defining the type of harm that we want to protect, which cannot be just mere uh, dignity or human rights. It has to be something else, much more similar to the ability of identifying the person and probably connecting it to some monetary interest, I guess. Thank you. Um, so, uh, one of the things that we were thinking of while uh, working were actually trying to identify which were the problems that uh, individuals might face uh, with new technologies such as uh, quantum computing. And actually, when uh, Lu uh, first Luigi approached me uh, and talked to me about this issue, he is more of the science guy. I am more of a listener. <laughs> and. Um, he was talking to me about actually a very, um, how do you call it, um, a, a very real concern. So the idea was that, uh, this is the question that he asked me, what happens if I have a credit card, I have my social uh, security number, social insurance number, depending where you are, and today it gets stolen. Uh, but let's say that all of this data now, it is absolutely, encrypted, uh, the person who stole it can't treat it, they will not know now what is my information, the data that I'm trying to protect. They don't know this, uh, but what happens if in X amount of years or X amount of months, we don't know, unfortunately, uh, the uh, speed at which it's being developed, what happens if 
now this information that is not just valuable at the present moment, let's talk about, for example, a debit card. A debit card is going to expire, but my social insurance number likely won't. Uh, so what happens if that day they have this information, this encrypted information, and they can actually decrypt it? So that was more of a concrete uh, issue that he brought up right away. Uh, so rather than just, well, obviously there are several considerations that have to be made for what concerns in general data information and sensitive information about a subject. So as you said, for example, uh, the right to be forgotten and so on and so forth, these are relevant. But there are also monetary concerns for what concerns also the security of assets and so on. Uh, so if uh, Luigi wants to talk more about it. Yeah, I wanted to add a couple of things. I think your comment was really insightful. Um, and I think there's a few angles to approach it, right? One is that privacy, privacy compliance is definitely expensive, not only in terms like monetary, but also in terms of economic, inf in, um, economic incentives and transaction costs. So I, I feel like there's a significant discrepancy in how expensive and effort intensive it is for a startup that's really trying to scale and build a product it is to become compliant with privacy laws really compared to how much it is for a gigantic enterprise with an army of lawyers privacy officers and security people and i find that uh, often regulations really do not take this into consideration sometimes regulation have this one size fits all approach whereby they have this very high level um, wording that's really not easy to understand and not really easy to implement. And I find like, also you, you mentioned something that uh, obviously you said that anonymization is not compatible with some of the principle of GDPR. And I find that for instance, GDPR could actually be supplemented or explain better how this could be made uh, uh, compatible because for instance there is a, a form of encryption called homomorphic encryption which could enable for computation so for data to be processed without decrypting the data so you would still be compliant and you know still protect the data at the same time it wouldn't be anonymous it would be pseudonymized etc but that would work but I, I i still find that there is a strong asymmetry of information and a strong asymmetry in terms of economic cost transaction costs etc depending on who's looking at the regulation and who's not and i find that our like our research also was trying to look into this direction in the sense that um, like if you look at the issue of quantum computing, it's something that's very niche. So a lot of people talk about it, but very few know about it, really know about it. And um, um, also it's something that, even if you look at the white paper written by ENISA, it's something that's written by scientists, for scientists, for engineers. And at the same time, if you look at regulation, it's written by lawyers for lawyers. And so often you have this very strong asymmetry where who actually needs to implement a technical measure can't read the law and who needs to read the law can't read the technical measure. And I think we need to try and find a way to like, you know, bridge this gap. Excellent. Other questions, comments for anyone from anyone? Great. You've convinced us all that what you're doing is super interesting. I always enjoy this conference because it's always great to hear new, exciting scholarship. So um, thank you very much for um, for joining and for the discussion today. So um, uh, it was really great to, to hear from everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So much. Bye. 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 Bye.